Hey guys, welcome back. We're getting really, really close to producing some major league energy here. We just got through looking at the electron transport chain. We saw on the electron transport chain that no ATP was directly produced, but we also saw that what happened in the electron transport chain was a, was a systematic conversion of the potential energy that is found in high energy electrons into a chemical gradient that can be used to do work. Now let's back up and think about that again. What we saw there was the electrons were being offloaded to these complexes. And these complexes, we numbered one through four. We saw that complex one, three, and four actually had within them channel proteins. And channel proteins that were specific for hydrogen ions. Appreciating that hydrogens cannot move across the phospholipid membrane unless they have a pore to go across. The role of the high energy electrons was to physically pump hydrogen ions through these complexes and from the matrix and into the inner membranal space. You know, we used the word pumping, so that means it's active transport. And remember, active transport requires some type of carrier or channel protein plus some type of energy. The energy that we have here is going to be associated with high energy electrons, and the carrier, which is actually a channel protein, is going to be these complexes themselves. And we're going to physically move from a region of lower concentration to a region of higher concentration. We're going to move hydrogen ions against the grain, push them into the intermembranal space, setting up the potential to do work. And here is where we do the work. We do the work in a process known as chemoosmosis, in which we will systematically move those hydrogen ions from the intermembranal space back into the matrix. Let's think about that set of reactions as being oxidative phosphorylation. Now, chemoosmosis is a facilitated diffusion mechanism. Now, it's a facilitated diffusion mechanism. Remember what that means. It will allow the movement of a molecule across the membrane, but it requires a pore, or in this case, a channel protein, for that molecule to be carried through. That molecule is going to be moving back in for free, from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration is going to be hydrogen ions and it's going to be moving through a pore that is created by an intermembranal protein that is going to be known as ATP synthase. Now ATP synthase is a big deal. Take a look at it here and you can see that its components of it are embedded in the phospholipid itself and notice in the middle you see in this uh, depiction a hydrogen ion channel that is created. Now how does this work? ATP synthase is a protein complex that has a specialized channels protein embedded within it that permits the movement of the hydrogen ions via osmosis. This protein complex is actually the smallest rotary motor known to exist and it acts like the water wheel on the grist mill that we would see at Cades Cove. Now if you recall that grist mill at Cades Cove they had a creek and we used water, the water was caught by the water wheel, and it spun the water wheel. And when the water wheel spun, it had a rod that went in that drove, again, a set of gears that took a rock, a grist stone, and ground corn. Now here, instead of it being water, we're going to have the hydrogen ions moving back into the mitochondrial matrix. And they're going to be moving based on simple diffusion from a region of high concentration to a region of lower concentration. And as they move in, they spin the wheel, the protein here that is that we could think of as a wheel. And as the wheel turns, uh, the rod and the knob also will turn. Now as the rod and the knob turn, within the knob there's going to be catalytic sites. And those catalytic sites, energized by the movement of the hydrogens, are going to take the energy from the spinning that we see here, the rotary that we see here, and instead of grinding corn that we would see in the grist mill, they're going to actually use that energy to create a phosphate bond onto an ADP molecule to create ATP molecules. Now this is a high energy bond, but notice the high energy bond is created by the movement of hydrogen ions from a region of higher concentration to a region of lower concentration. So the energy generated from the turning catalyzes the high energy tertiary phosphate bond on the ATP. This is what we know as oxidative phosphorylation. Because the NADH is oxidized, we remove the hydrogen, and the energy from those electrons is used to create ATP molecules instead of breaking of covalent bonds as we would see in substrate level phosphorylation. Let's summarize a set of events. At the end of the electron transport chain in oxidative phosphorylation, 
Each of the NADH and FADH2 molecules have been converted to energy. In the case of the NADH molecule, it will be converted into 2.5 to 3 ATP molecules. Each of the FADH2 molecules will be converted into either 1.5 to 2 ATP molecules, depending upon the source that you choose to reference. For our initial example, we will use the higher value. Now this means that in the electron transport chain in the oxidative phosphorylation, we will convert 10 NADHs into 30 ATPs, 3 ATPs per NAD, and the 2 FADH2 molecules into 4 ATPs for a net total of 34 ATPs. Yet I will tell you that two of those NADHs were produced in the cytoplasm during glycolysis. And we've got to actively transport those NADH molecules into the mitochondria so that they can get to the electron transport chain. And this active transport requires the cost of energy in the form of ATP, equivalent to about one ATP per NADH. So we've got to take two of those ATPs that we produce in oxidative phosphorylation and actually use them to prime the process to get to NADHs in from the cytoplasm. So our net gain is going to be 32 ATPs. Recent catabolic research, though, suggests that the oxidative phosphorylation is not as efficient as we thought. Instead of generating 3 ATPs per NADH, it actually generates only 2.5. This would give us a total of 25 ATPs per glucose molecule being produced from the NADH molecules itself. Research also suggests that the FADH2 molecules convert their high energy electrons into the equivalent of 1.5 ATPs per FADH2 molecule, or a total of 3 ATPs. For the net, that oxidative phosphorylation then being somewhere in the neighborhood of 28 ATPs per glucose molecule. Now if we sum all this up, then what we would see is that in the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation, we realize somewhere in the neighborhood of our 28 to 32 ATPs from the conversion of the 10 NADHs and the 2 FADH2 molecules that we carry in there. This means that aerobic uh, catabolism is somewhere between 30 and 34 percent efficient in converting potential energy within the covalent bonds of glucose molecule into cellular energy in the form of ATP molecules. The remaining is released as heat, a non-reusable energy that is essential to maintain a relatively high body temperature of 37 degrees C. While this seems inefficient compared to the most efficient automobiles that function at about 25%, catabolism is remarkably efficient. At the end of, of the electron transport chain, the oxygen molecule that is transported to the mitochondria will receive the hydrogen ions and produces the end product of six molecular waters. Thus, oxygen is the end acceptor of the hydrogen ions in the process of oxidative phosphorylation. You guys have a great day. See you later.